Hello and welcome back to That's English. Hi there. Our first documentary is about the joyful emotions people feel when they get married and the painful emotions associated with divorce. We meet a woman who has just split up from her husband after 31 years of marriage. And a young couple who are about to get married or tie the knot. Let's watch. Your wedding day. They say it's one of the happiest days of your life, full of love and emotion. And the years after you tie the knot are also full of emotion, just a different kind. The wedding day was very family-filled, great fun. It was a joyful day. However, like thousands of other couples in the UK, Dorinda's no longer with her partner. The couple split up in 2014, 31 years after they said, I do. She tells us when things started to change. I started to do charity tracks and um, and did things that I'd never done before, pushed a lot of boundaries. So I went from being a very doormatty type of wife to someone who climbed Everest to the base camp and uh, travelled far and wide. And people were interested in my travels and adventures. And my husband was a typical alpha male. And I think he resented the attention that I got. The process of getting a divorce can be as painful as the wedding day is happy. Um, going through a divorce was the hardest thing ever. Um, the emotions were far-ranging. They were painful and they were um, so thought-provoking because everything that you take for granted starts to change. It's the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my life. Because getting a divorce can be such a roller coaster of emotions, it's a time when people learn to manage their feelings. Cheryl Massey is a family therapist. She tells us what can be done to manage emotions during this turbulent time. Marriage is the only intimate relationship that's limited socially, morally and emotionally. This means in a marriage when there are negative emotions, they can't be shared. In other relationships, like friendships or birth family, one speaks freely about one's emotions. This means things get challenged, they get aired and they get thought through. The privacy of marriage denies this very often. Around 250,000 couples get married in the UK every year. In the same year, around 100,000 couples get divorced. However, these statistics mean nothing to couples that are in love. Emma Baines and Sean Brady are engaged and are busy planning their wedding. They share their excitement about the decision to get married. We've always believed in marriage. Um, it was all just about the timing for us and now it's the perfect time for us to get married. Yeah. yeah I wanted us to have a home first and we wanted to have a dog as well, so... <laughs> Today, Emma and Sean are working out their seating plan. Table 10, because they're kind of around the middle section there, aren't they? <laughs> Pretty much in the shadows there, um, and by the toilets. I hope they're all right with that. Um, okay. Sean tells us how he feels about the wedding day. So there is that enormous excitement and anticipation, but at the same time, with the greatest excitement, there could be the greatest fall, there could be the greatest accident, and everybody that you know is going to remember that. <laughs> but that's not preying on my mind, otherwise you'd never get married. Um, so I, I'm, I'm more focused on, on the whole excitement, I'm keeping positive. I, I just think it's going to be the greatest day, so I'm, I'm really excited. Cheryl explains why emotional intelligence is important for building strong relationships. Emotional intelligence helps us meet our own needs, which is basically problem solving. If we fail to have emotional intelligence, it means that we fail to see the dignity in others, and it means we don't act in a way that's respectful. So perhaps the secret to a long and happy marriage has a lot to do with learning to be the master of your own emotions. 
So, around 250,000 couples get married every year in the UK, but 100,000 get divorced. One reason for the high number of divorces is that people often change as they get older, and that can cause problems in a marriage. Dorinda talked about how things changed in her marriage. I started to do charity tracks and, um, and did things that I'd never done before, pushed a lot of boundaries. So I went from being a very doormatty type of wife to someone who climbed Everest to the base camp and uh, travelled far and wide. She said she started to push the boundaries by doing new things. And she went from being a doormatty type of wife, that means a wife who lets her husband dominate her, to being an adventurous type. Now, we asked our international friends, do you think people in your country tend to be emotional or do they hide their emotions? People in Jamaica definitely don't hide their emotions. Uh, it's very easy to see and uh, they have no problems letting you know exactly how they're feeling. It's considered to be very bad form to be overly emotional in New Zealand. And that's because of our British settlers. They believed in stiff upper lip when things went horribly wrong. But it's also a Maori thing. The Maoris were warriors and showing emotion was deemed to be very bad form with them too. I think South Africans are generally very expressive people and very emotional and less reservedly than the European countries. I would say that the people of Scotland tend to hide their emotions a bit more. They don't like to show when they're upset about something or they don't like to cry in public. In Australia, we tend to hide our emotions. It's very important to be seen to be positive and fair on the outside, even if you're feeling sad or unhappy on the inside. I think people in Canada tend to be, I wouldn't say hide emotions, but maybe less emotional than other countries. I don't think we, we are as emotionally open as some people, maybe a little bit more closed or reserved. I'd say we're very emotional, uh, that we wear our emotions on our sleeve. I think they can be both ways. Uh, you can be emotional about sports or the Oscars or music or politics but something that you're really um, having a difficulty with, whether it be work or emotional things, I, I think people keep inside, especially if they're men. So, in several English-speaking countries, people tend to hide their emotions. They keep a stiff upper lip. But one of the US speakers said they wore their emotions on their sleeve, which means they show them very openly. Well, now it's time for our travel section. That's the USA. In this module, our presenter, Jody, will be showing us around Florida. She starts her tour in Miami. Isn't she lucky? I've always wanted to go there. <laughs> And welcome to That's the USA. I'm your presenter, Jody Darren, and I'll be traveling around the sunshine state of Florida, showing you some of its treasured attractions, customs, and culture. We begin our adventure right here on the southeast coast in the city of Miami. Miami is a lively, booming city with a 24-hour lifestyle, attracting more than 14 million visitors every year. It's a leading city in every area. One of the best ways to tour Miami is on two wheels, so you can rent a bike, or for the less energetic, you can rent one of these, a Segway. I'm in downtown Miami with Andrea from Bike and Roll. What do you think makes Miami such a special place? I think it has a lot to do with the way it has grown so quickly. When it was established, it happened in just a matter of a few years. And it's nicknamed the Magic City for the very same reason. It's taken the interest of a few and expanded very quickly. 
Would you say Miami is a city of strong emotions? I would definitely say that, yes, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that it's made up of mostly foreigners. Something like 70% of the community is from South American countries, from the Caribbean. So there's a lot of different diversity here in terms of culture, definitely. Well, thank you so much. I guess I'm off on my tour. Of course. My pleasure. <laughs> Bye. This is the Adrian Arsch Center for the Performing Arts, Theater, Dance, and Music. This is the Freedom Tower, the symbolic Ellis Island of Florida for the Cubans. When Cuban refugees arrived here in the 1960s, this was where they came to be documented and processed. The Riverwalk here in the downtown core offers spectacular views of the Miami River and the Intercoastal Waterway. This is just so much fun. I'm in Little Havana, also known as the Latin Quarter. This area is home to the large Cuban community in the city. Visitors can learn about Cuban history on the Cuban Memorial Boulevard. One of Little Havana's most popular landmarks is Maximo Gomez Park, or Domino Park. For 35 years, it's been a popular meeting spot for older Cuban residents who come here to play dominoes and chat with their friends. Calle Ocho is the main road here in Little Havana, and every year it plays host to the largest block party or street party in the country. Like any great party, Calle Ocho has it all. Hundreds of food stalls and kiosks, dancing to the sounds of salsa and merengue, costumes, street performers. We're here on Calle Ocho and it's just such a fun and lively day. What makes this festival so popular? Well, first of all, this is the largest block party in the U.S. It brings all cultures from all over the U.S the music, the food, the people, and you can't beat the weather. It is Miami. beautiful, isn't it? It attracts it at least a million people comes to the street fair every year. It's only for one day, and everybody unites here in Miami, all the different cultures of Latin American countries. Great, well enjoy your day here on Calle Ocho. Enjoy. All right, right let's there. go dancing, huh? Yeah, but... <laughs> an electric celebration. I'm having such a blast. See you next time in the Everglades. The Calle Ocho Festival looks fun. We'd call it a street party, but in the US, they say block party. Jodie's having a great time. She's having a blast. Miami's got something for everyone. It's a booming city, which means it's growing rapidly. Well, I'm afraid that's all for today. Bye for now. Bye-bye.